Lara received her BS at the University of Texas at Austin in the Child Development and Family Relationships. She took classes requiring involvement with the lab school and completed her practicum at the lab school. She received her MED with a focus in early childhood from the University of Texas at Tyler. Lara is passionate about helping children build a strong self-concept and social emotional health in a positive classroom that enriches all areas of development. After today's webinar remarks, Lara will take questions. Please submit them via the Q&A or chat function. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Lara. I will now turn it over to you. Um, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure to be here, and I'm hoping that today I can um, give you some tips to help you at home with young children. I know it's hard. Um, I was somewhere recently and saw a little placard on the wall, and it said, some days I worry about, um, you know, if my children will turn out okay, but Mostly I'm just worried if I'm gonna survive them today. So I know that it can be really hard and stressful. And um, so anyway, I'm gonna share my screen. So to start out, um, I thought I'd start with just some general survival tips. And all of these things come from what we know about um, brain science and how children learn, and also um, how children cope and deal with stress and anxiety. So while there are a lot of similarities between the ways that adults deal with stress and anxiety, um, there also are differences. And so some of these things maybe will be helpful for you. So general survival tips. The first thing that you need to know is that your self-care is very, very important during this time. So as they say, or they used to say on the airplane, um, you know, put on your oxygen mask first and every little bit of self-care that you can fit in to your daily routine or whenever you can fit it in is gonna be helpful because you know the better rested and um, the less stressed you are as the parent, um, the better you're going to be able to cope with the stresses and, and things that come up with your kids. So take care of yourself first and foremost. Um, the other thing that I think is so important right now is maintaining routines. And, um, you know, you're probably saying, well, I would love to be maintaining a routine, um, but all of that was taken away from me with this virus. Um, so we've had to be inventive and think of new routines. and. That's what's important is thinking about your new routine and trying to maintain consistency. And remember that a routine is not the same as a schedule. So I love a schedule. I like to adhere to my schedule. I'm very, you know, let's have a plan and let's stick to it. But that's not always possible. Um, it is possible to maintain a routine without sticking to a schedule. So for example, if part of your bedtime routine is reading three stories, um, maybe you're a little off and running behind. And so instead of three stories, you only have time to read one. So you're still reading the story and maintaining that part of your routine. You just changed um, you know, the schedule a little bit. Oops, sorry about that. Um, so maintaining a routine and just keep in mind, routines are things that you do and the order in which you do them, not necessarily the timeline that we think of with a schedule. Another thing that I think is really important for right now is for um, parents to really adjust your expectations um, of yourself as a parent and also of your kids. Um, I think right now keeping it simple is really important for everyone's mental health and well-being. And so you can think about your family and what is important for your particular family. Every family is different and what might be a priority for one family is not necessarily important for another. So you can think with your um, parenting partner or think for yourself about what's important for you and what's um, what are things that um, are at the top of your list in terms of getting done and priorities. 
The other thing I would say in terms of expectations is to remember that there are a lot of things that we don't have any control over as parents. Um, and so focusing on what you can control can be really important for your own uh, mental well being. You know, sleeping, eating, exercising, staying connected. Um, even though staying connected looks different now than it did, you know, three months ago it still is important to maintain those connections. So with family, with friends, you can utilize the technology that we have available to us. And um, while it's definitely not the same as being in person with someone, it is better than nothing. Um, then the other thing I would say in terms of expectations is just to be flexible. And as I mentioned, sometimes that's hard depending on um, our personalities. Some people are um, easygoing and um, flexible naturally. I'm not that kind of person, but I have trained myself to be because when you work in early childhood, flexibility is the key, you know? Um, and sometimes you're gonna have the fondest memories of the times that you kind of gave up on what you expected to happen and went with um, the kind of organic moment that created itself. So be flexible. Um, I think it's important too for us to remember that, um, you know, we're having a lot of togetherness. And so it's probably worth a chuckle that I said, allow time for togetherness. But um, you can be in the same space and not be together. Um, so I say, you know, allow time for togetherness where you're act actually engaged with one another but also time to be alone. And I think that's important for young children, children of all ages, frankly. Um, you know, sometimes we think, we don't think about children as needing time alone, but they also need time, particularly children who are more introverted in terms of their personality. They really need that time alone to um, kind of regenerate and get themselves kind of restored where they can be sociable again. So allowing for that in safe ways, you know, um, if they can spend some time in their room if they want to, or, you know, kind of quiet alone time is important for adults and for children. Okay, so working at home. Um, and a, a lot of this applies to general survival tips as well. So you can think of it um, in that way. But generally, I think it's really important that you schedule time for children or your or child to have your undivided attention. And as I said, you know, you could be working at the table and your child could be next to you. But if you're not engaged with your child, then they're not perceiving that as time spent with them necessarily. So schedule times that you are giving them your attention and you're engaged with them. And one easy way to do this, well, I say easy, one way to do this is to work your time together um, where you're giving your, your time into things that you're already having to do on a daily basis, like meal times and um, exercising. You know, if you can go for a walk together as a family or go for a bike ride or um, something like that, even putting on an exercise, you know, video and dancing or music, putting on music and dancing together in your living room, you know, can be fun together time. Um, also household chores and routines and activities, you can try to make those into um, fun activities make them into games, you know, sorting laundry, often things that we think are a chore, kids actually enjoy and find very interesting. So matching socks and folding washcloths, you know, um, you can enjoy that time together with your child and they can be learning about how to be helpful. And children really love to have real tasks to do. They're pretty good at knowing when we're trying to just keep them busy versus when they're doing something that's really valuable and is contributing to the family. Um, you can think about your individual children and their likes and preferences, and that can help you 
think of things. You know, maybe you have a child who loves puzzles. Maybe you have a child that um, you sit and read together, or maybe a child that, you know, loves to play games and you play a game with them. So whatever it is that's interesting for them. And I think it's important to, to balance your um, kind of planning those things and activities like mealtime and exercise and things to um, empower your kids to be the driver sometimes, uh, letting them choose what it is that they want to do. Um, maybe you have a list of chores that need to be done and you let them have a choice about which thing they would like to help with or how they would like to help instead of it all being driven by um, you as the parent. I did wanna point out um, an excellent resource called the Family Dinner Project. And on their webpage, they have um, ideas for meal times. but one of my favorite things about that site is a tab on the site called Conversation Starters. And they have all kinds of prompts that you can use at mealtime for children of all ages from very young to um, teenagers and adults even. Interesting questions and kind of um, open-ended questions that you can ask to get conversations started at dinner time or any meal time for that matter. Um, another thing I would say that I think is really important is if you have a parenting partner really work with your partner to share responsibilities. Now more than ever, it's really important for us as adults to be good communicators, especially with the people that we are cooped up in the house with. And so if you can do, you know, each morning have a meeting maybe before the kids come uh, wake up or while they're having breakfast before the day gets started, and kind of talk about who has a meeting when and who who can kind of be on in terms of in charge of you know, the kids versus who's actually needing to focus on work. Um, you could even do that the night before, after the kids go to bed, just kind of looking ahead. Um, I think that can be really helpful. Also, one thing that you can do is kind of develop what I call a cueing system so that your children have visual and spatial cues about when you're available and when you're um, really working and need them to um, be busy with another task um, or ask another parent for help. So that might look like um, closing the door and putting a sign on the door when you're working or in a meeting. Um, if you're really doing something that is interruptible, you know, you could leave the door open or take down the sign and that would not let your kids know that you, um, you can be interrupted or if they need something, they can come to you. Um, it's also ideal, if it's at all possible within your home space, to set up a workspace that is separate from the kids. Um, I have a friend who has three young children who is working out of his master bedroom closet right now. And so he literally took the card table and a lamp and um, his work into his master bedroom closet. So he can close the door and be a couple doors removed from his kids. Um, and he and his partner, you know, take turns and share responsibility. So you might have to get creative, but if you can have a separate space, that also will help your children know, okay, you know, mom or dad is in their workspace, they're working right now. Um, one thing that will help your kids, um, I know often as adults, we like to kind of get in a flow and, you know, get things going and work for maybe extended periods of time. But because children have shorter attention spans, if you can kind of chunk your work into shorter time periods so that you have breaks to see your kids and spend time with them, um, it would be better to say, you know, work for an hour and take a 15 minute break than it would be to work for three hours and then take a 30 minute break, if that makes sense. You know, it's better to work in shorter periods of time and give your kids um, some attention more often, even if it's for shorter periods of time, um, because that um, will be better with their attention span. Um, also, it's not on here, but I would say, um, you know, it's, it's definitely helpful to let your kids know 
when they're doing what you want them to do and let them know specifically what they're doing. So there's a lot of research that talks about um, the value of encouragement versus praise. So if a child does something, you know, lets you have your meeting without knocking on your door, interrupting, instead of saying, great job, you can say, you waited very patiently for me to be finished with my meeting. Thank you for waiting patiently. And that gives the child some very concrete information about what he or she did. Um, so again, if you can think about giving that encouragement and that kind of positive reinforcement when your kids are doing what you're, what you're wanting them to do, because it's hard for them. Um, you know, generally when you're at home, it's family time and you're not working unless you were working from home before the virus. Um, so in a child's mind, their thinking is, um, you know, if we're all home together, then it's family time, like a weekend time. And this is totally different for them. So it's, you know, we have to help them understand that things are different. Um, okay, so no questions so far, I guess. I'll feel free to ask if you have some. Okay, and then I want to talk a little bit before we move on to um, websites that I'd like to share with you that I think you might find helpful as resources, just ways that you can support your kids emotionally. This is so important always, but now especially, um, and I think it's really critical that we give children time and space to talk about their feelings and that we accept all the feelings that come. You know, sometimes I think as adults, people think, oh, they're, you know, they're three or four. What do they have that's stressful? Um, they don't understand, you know, about work or money or the things that we as adults consider very worrisome and anxiety producing but they have valid worries and anxieties that are valid for their age. So they have feelings that go along with those um, anxieties or concerns. Um, they also have happy feelings um, and we just need to be um, prepared for all of those things and know that all of those things are okay. It's very okay for them to be angry right now um, to be sad right now. It's okay for them to be happy right now or be frustrated right now. And so um, we can listen and validate all of those feelings that come. Um, and that goes a long way to help them kind of um, process those feelings. Uh, the next bullet item says listen and validate. And that can be really hard. Right now, um, one way that children communicate is through their behavior. And it's important for us as adults to remember that all behavior is communicating something to us. And it may be kind of what we would call unwanted behavior or inappropriate behavior that the child is trying to tell us something. And so we have to really think about what is causing the behavior and become curious investigators and say, hmm, why is this happening? You know, why is my child behaving like this? And there's a lot going on right now that could be attributed or causing that behavior to happen. Um, stress and change often lead to unwanted behaviors in children or to regression. So maybe your child was using the toilet regularly or sleeping through the night, and now all of a sudden they're having accidents or they're waking up a lot. Um, also, stress and change can lead to limit testing. So a child who's maybe normally um, pretty compliant might be not so compliant right now. And it's important for you to remember that as hard as it is and stressful, um, they're trying to communicate to you that they are having these big feelings. Um, I think it's good to, for parents to be able to remind ourselves that we don't have to fix the situation. Um, we can listen and validate the feelings. We can say things like, I know you're really sad that you can't play with your friends right now or that you can't have your friend over for the play date. Um, I know that makes you very angry. I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry it makes you angry. I would be very angry too. 
instead of trying to give in or saying, oh, I can see that you're very angry. How about some ice cream, you know, to try to redirect. It's okay to just validate the feelings and listen and um, without feeling like we have to offer a solution. And I know that's hard sometimes to do as a parent because we, it's hard for us to see our kids upset and sad. Um, another thing that we can do right now that's really important is to provide open age appropriate communication about what is happening. And I'm gonna show you some resources at the end that are on the Lab School website that give you very specific information about what is appropriate for each age. Sometimes it's hard to know, you know, okay, well, how do I appropriately explain, you know, the COVID-19 and why we're wearing a mask to a three-year-old? Um, and so I'll share with you some resources that will give you some very specific information about things that you can say. But one thing I would caution you about is to be very aware of your child's um, exposure to media right now. Because even if you have the news on in the background, even if it's on mute and they're showing, you know, pictures of maybe some hospital scene or, you know, the virus graphics floating around, that can be really upsetting for children and hard for them to process. They often, young children, do not understand the difference between fantasy and reality, and they can't distinguish that. Um, they also can't distinguish between what's far away and not going to impact them versus what might impact them directly. So if you can be very um, you know, mindful and aware of the exposure that they're having to media, that can be really helpful for reducing their anxiety. I found honestly that just for myself, um, when all of this started, I was looking at you know Twitter and, and the news a lot to try to get information. And it was really causing me a lot of stress because no one really had a lot of the um, answers, concrete answers. And I decided that I was gonna stop doing that and just check like once late in the afternoon and kind of see what the latest was for that day. And I noticed that my stress level went way down when I wasn't constantly monitoring the news. And so you might find that helpful for yourself to, to kind of watch that less. Um, a couple of great resources. Um, again, I'll give you a list or show you where you can find a whole list, but the Momentous Institute has a lot of great information for families. They also have some great videos that children can watch that talk about breathing techniques and things that they can do when they're feeling stressful and um, ways that you can talk with children about how their brain works and what happens when they feel stressful stressed or when they feel really big feelings, what hap what's happening in their brain to help them understand. Um, Harvard Center for the Developing Child is a great resource as well. And then um, CASEL, which is the Collaborative for um, Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning is also a great resource. Um, if you just have time to, you know, check on a few, those are three that I would really recommend. Okay, I thought I saw a little box pop up. Okay. Um, the last thing too is, um, I mentioned at first that, you know, children's worries are often very different from ours. They worry about things that are immediate and directly impacting them. And that's what's appropriate for them to worry about. And so it's important to remember that, um, even though it may seem Kind of inconsequential to us or trivial to us as adults. It's very real and very stressful for children. Um, I think back sometimes over different points in my life and I think, you know, okay, what I thought was stressful at this point in my life now looking back that I have adult children and aging parents, my stresses are totally different. Um, and I think, oh, okay, those stresses would have been maybe nice to have now. But at the time, they were very real and valid to me. So I think it's important for us as adults and parents to remember that the feelings and stresses that our kids are feeling are very real and sometimes very big for them. And so we, again, need to just listen and validate those feelings. So, um, okay. Remember, it's really important to remember that children are as are all people generally, are adaptable and resilient with appropriate supports. 
So it'll be a lot of interesting research for the future to see how this COVID and um, stay at home uh, period has affected them in terms of development, but children are resilient and adaptable. And so you can be the support for them. You can, um, you know, do your best to manage your own stress and well-being and provide that support for them so that they will be okay. And if you have a, you know, an off day as a parent, then you can practice that flexibility, you know, show yourself a little grace and forgiveness and say, okay, tomorrow is a new day and um, another chance. Okay. So I would like to share some resources with you, just a few of my favorites. And then I will show you where you can find a whole bunch more. So if you're really curious um, or if you're really desperate for activities to do with your kids while you're at home, um, I will steer you in the right direction. One of my favorite sites is the Children's Learning Institute Engage Family. And the Children's Learning Institute is actually housed in Houston at the University of Houston Health Science Center. And this particular site or part of their program is geared for children birth to six years of age. And they have um, a bunch of, a collection of different activities that you can do with children over seven different learning domains. So language and communication, reading and writing, math, science, social and emotional learning, physical development, and then art and sensory. So let's see if this works here. Okay, so this is the Children's Learning Institute. And I was showing you, even though you couldn't see, that um, you can search this site by the child's age. You can look for specific activities based on an age range, or you can look by um, learning domain if you're looking for a certain um, a specific activity to do. Um, you can also just look at the activities that have videos that accompany them. And those are kind of fun because you can, um, it'll show you how to do it, which is kind of nice because sometimes you can read a description of an activity and you may be thinking, what would that look like exactly? How am I supposed to do that? So um, I think that that is, um, you can create an account also, but you don't have to create an account. I think if you create an account, it lets you um, kind of save favorites and that kind of thing, but it's not necessary to do that. Okay, the next one is called Vroom. And um, I, I really love this resource. It's so much fun. Um, let me open it and then I'll go to where you can actually see it. Okay, good, all right. Um, so Vroom is another great resource. It has the science behind what they're doing. Again, you can create an account. Vroom actually has an app and you can sign up to get um, tips each day. You can print things to try at home. Um, Vroom is a project of the Bezos Family Foundation and they're really looking at neuroscience and brain building and how you can create those brain building opportunities in your everyday life. So as you do activities with your kids, like for example, this one, you know, when you're out and about um, point out things in that you've read about in books or shows that you've watched and no one knows your kids better than you do. And so you are in a perfect position to um, think about those connections with them. This is really for children birth to age five but it has some great activities, um, science behind the learning, and then a little bit more about the, um, the foundation and Vroom. So that's a great resource. Okay, let's see. Um, Laura, we had a question yeah. come through. Okay, of um, course. The question is uh, in relation to applications to a one-year-old. Um, okay. Would a queuing system be effective with a one-year-old? Would they pick up on a particular kind of sign? Probably not, probably not. Um, with a one-year-old, you're really probably gonna just really need to do the tag teaming with the parenting partner if, if there is one available. Um, because at that age, cognitively, um, they just don't have 
um, you know, the cognitive understanding to kind of get, oh yeah, that sign means I can't go in there. Um, you know, you could with a one-year-old try to maybe schedule two around like sleeping patterns and try to like schedule important meetings and things for nap time. Um, I know that's not um, probably the answer that you're looking for, but it's, it's really probably going to be the best bet. I also wanted to share this resource with y'all. If you're not familiar with Common Sense Media, it is a great resource for parents um, pre-COVID even. Um, I, my kids are in their 20s and I used this as they were um, in elementary school and beyond because what Common Sense Media does is they offer reviews of games and books and apps, um, video games, movies, and television shows, and they're age appropriate. So you do need to create an account, but it's free. And um, let's see if I can show you. So it'll give you kind of an age that's um, appropriate. And then it'll give you exact details about um, why they're saying it's rated that way, like, you know, content wise in terms of if there's, you know, swearing or if it has sexual content or whatever. Um, it also will give you things to talk about with the, the show, um, kind of discussion points. And um, it also has one thing that I've enjoyed is the kids sometimes will do their own review. And one of my favorites was from um, a horror movie and a child who was like 10 had, had written a review and said, I really wish I hadn't seen this movie. It was really too scary for me. And I thought that was pretty insightful. Um, but anyway, they have recommendations. They also have a lot of um, information for parents that's broken down by age, as you can see, also by topic, so cell phones and screen time. Um, one thing that I am seeing in research and advice right now that I'll share is that, you know, part of being flexible might include being flexible with your children's use of screen time right now. I know generally um, sometimes parents are pretty hardline about that. You know, my three-year-old has no screen time whatsoever. Um, I would say that particularly for preschool age children, there is actually some pretty good content out there. You of course have to monitor that um, and be aware of what it is that they're watching and you know, watch, watch with them if possible. But um you may just have to be a little more flexible, you know, or give yourself a little wiggle room there if, if that's not something that you, you normally do. But it, it talks about, so screen time and social media use, and the goal of common sense media is not to try to, you know, eradicate um, media. Their, their take is that it's here to stay. We just need to learn how to be wise consumers and to teach our children how to be good digital citizens and wise consumers of the digital content that's available to them. So it's really helpful in terms of knowing um, or helping you decide what's really appropriate for um, your child. And of course, every child's different, but the more information you have, the better informed decision you can make. Um, it also talks about you know, some of the um, platforms that are available right now. YouTube, Snapchat, TikTok. Um, if you have a teenager, a, you know, a child who's in between, they might be begging you for, um, you know, a Snapchat account or Instagram or whatever. So you can, this is just a great resource with lots of good information. Okay. So, last but not least, I want to show you, and I'm happy to, um, I'm going to answer questions that you have, but if you think of some questions or if you just want, um, if you want a copy of the slides so that you can refer back to some things that I said, I'm happy to share it with you via email. If you want to email me, my email address is on the screen right now. Um, but I did want to show you the Lab School website. And this is a great um, resource because it has. Family resources, which are going to be the things that I mentioned 
uh, in the first few slides about, you know, talking to children about the coronavirus, materials, you know, a comic book exploring, um, Dave the dog is worried about coronavirus. Those are things that you could access to help your child understand. Um, and then some of these, like there's the Momentous Institute that I talked about. Um, zero to three is a great resource as well. Um, so those are, those are helpful. Then the other tab that's on the Lab School website is chock full of things that you can do at home by category. So there are stories and podcasts and it tell, the T is for toddler. Pre-K would be, you know, four, three, four, and then kindergarten, of course, five. Um, so there are a lot of really fun things there. There also are hands-on exper experiences that you can do. Um, some yoga, play a feelings word game, um, all kinds of things that you can do. Academic content specifically, I know, um, you know, the school year for um, kindergarten and up is, is coming to an end, but um, a lot of children enjoy and find value in these. Um, the National Geographic has a great website. Um, lots of new stuff. And a lot of these sites also have things for older children as well. Um, kindergarten is the age that is the oldest um, age group at the lab school, but a lot of these um, are very appropriate for children over, you know, elementary school age and even some um, into the teenage years. And then there are some very, um, very fun virtual field trips. So all of those things are kind of fun if you're looking for stuff to do. So you can find that at the Lab School website. So any questions that I can answer? Hi, Laura. Hi. It's Heather. Um, so I I don't have little ones at home. Mine is actually graduating this week, but I have a yes. four and five yeah. And my sister, the competition for resources, like they, they used to get along really well. I mean, all siblings have rivalry, but it really seems to have intensified uh, in the last three, four weeks. Um, they, yeah. If the other one has her attention, then they're fighting it out. It's just, it's a, and it applies to her and to me and to their grandmother. Like everybody, if they're paying attention to one, the other one wants it. Yeah. And so you said they're four and four and five. Yes, they are. Okay, okay. Um, I think probably, uh, you know, it's hard because they are young, but at the same time, they're capable of understanding quite a bit. And so I think a lot of um, validating feelings and saying, you know, I understand that you would like to have, you know, my attention or whatever um, is, is a good thing like to point out to them okay you know what but i think bigger than that is even maybe it would be helpful to to have um even a schedule of some sort where the kids could see okay at this point it's going to be my turn you know with aunt heather or grandma or mom or dad or what whoever you know is involved and i know that seems maybe complicated and like do we really need to do that but, you know, children are very concrete and they, um, visual cues often help them. So if they could develop um, some sort of written kind of schedule or routine so that the kids know, okay, I am going to get this time, then they might even see a decrease over time and not have to stick with that so much once the kids kind of see, okay, I am going to get the attention that I need. Um, it's... I think it really kind of goes back to, to that, you know, all behavior is some kind of communication. And so to think about, you know, what are the kids really saying here? You know, are they wanting attention? Probably. Um, are they, you know, maybe wanting some power or a sense of control? Um, those are, those are good questions. And then once you figure out what's driving the behavior, then you can try to meet that, you know, meet that need better sometimes. Did that help at all? Yeah, definitely. The schedule okay. time will be 
Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, you know, it can be hard and it, I don't think it necessarily needs to be like huge blocks of time, but I think, you know, if you say this is going to be your, you know, even if it's 15 minutes, um, you know, that can seem like a long time when it's, when they have your undivided attention. And then I would say, you know, if the other child comes over, oh, you know, look at this schedule here. It's, so-and-so's turn and it's going to be your turn at this point and I'm so excited you know to spend that time with you and be thinking about what you want to do you know when it's our time together um to kind of build that anticipation and then I think to also factor and plan in times for everyone to do things together because you know that's important too thanks Laura um yeah we have another question yeah. Um, do you have any ideas for activities that would build cooperation? Um, one of our participants has a five and eight year old that are constantly competing or fighting over limited resources and they'd love to build and develop their cooperation. Okay. Um, yeah, a lot of those websites that I mentioned have um, kind of teamwork kind of things where you, it's something that you can't do by yourself. You have to have someone do it with you. Um, like one person has to hold something while the other person throws it. Um, you know, the, I think the, the best approach probably in that situation, instead of trying to force them to um, get along would be to think of fun ways to have them have to work together. And one thing that might work with that age is if you do a little competition within the family and make the kids on a team and maybe like, you know, maybe the kids are racing against mom to try to clean up the room the fastest or whatever, so that they are, instead of competing against each other, they're having to work together to make something happen. Um, I think the key is that you don't want it to feel like it's, um, you know, a punishment for them because then they're going to be more resentful probably. So I think if you can think of fun ways that they can um, do teamwork, if there is, you know, a game that takes cooperation and, and a lot of those websites have things where you can, you know, look for, um, like matching games where everybody, each person gets a different, um, part of something and they have to match them together and um, those kind of games can help build that. I mean a lot of it depends too on your individual circumstances. It, it may just be a lot of togetherness. You know I know um, kids who share a room who normally it's great that they share a room and they're the best of friends because they've had their space to go and get away. They go, you know, when they're at school, they're getting that time away from each other, but now they're not. And so it's like too much togetherness. Um, and it may be that if they have a little more space that they might be a more cooperative. Also, as I suggested for Heather, having a schedule too, where they each get some undivided attention and get to kind of be in charge or choose what it is that they're going to do might help then when it's time for cooperation, make them feel less, you know, competitive for the attention, if that makes sense. Um, well, everyone is just so grateful for your insights today. Uh, Laura, we want to thank you for well, joining sure. us. And well, I hope it and helped. And if, um, as I said, I'm happy to, you know, if you want to email me, I'm happy to, you know, try to answer questions or, or further questions. If you think of something or there was something that you didn't want to ask in the group, you're, I'm happy to answer emails and also just to share the, um, the slides with you if you're interested at all. Absolutely. Um, we'll be posting the webinar on our CNS YouTube channel okay. and uh, we'll be working with you to provide the links to the presentation on our CNS Connect website as well. Oh, perfect. Um, so we'll be in touch for that so that way everyone great. can um, utilize those resources. Okay, um, so great. Thank you everyone for joining us on this webinar great. today and we hope you'll join us again in one of our upcoming presentations in the CNS Connect series. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye.